welcome to the Reading Revelers, the Reading Revelers series. Today, we have Sir William Wang and Sir Ashay Sharma, who will be talking about startup from an engineering perspective. Both of our, our hosts and guests have an engineering background and they have experience uh, working for early stage companies, creating their own and, and doing both the, the hard work of, of uh, creating a company and also uh, selling the product, the company, the idea and everything uh, in, the, in the Vancouver market, in the Canadian market uh, and everywhere else. So uh, uh, we, we have a few more people still joining in. So I think I'll, I'll admit them in the meantime. So while I while I invite more uh, more participants joining the the room here, uh, I'd like to share some of the etiquettes for the program. If you are new to the show, uh, you can, I, I suggest that you keep your microphone off and your videos off uh, until and unless uh, the host asks you to do so. Uh, you can ask your questions in the chat. This helps uh, our our hosts and guests to run the show better. They can read your questions whenever it's convenient to them. Uh, if you'd like to ask your questions by yourself you are more than welcome to do so. And if I may have your permission, this prog program is also going to be uh, recorded, which I should press the record button shortly here. Welcome everyone to the Reading Revelers. Today, we have Mr. William Wang with us and to host his program, we have invited Mr. Ashay Sharma. They're both entrepreneurs, engineers, uh, startup people in, in the Vancouver community in Canada. And I'm so grateful to have both of them join us here today, to talk about startup uh, from an engineering perspective. Uh, for the rest of the program and the introduction uh, of the host, uh, I, I would like to pass it on to Ashay Sharma. Uh, Ashay uh, graduated from UBC in engineering, while studying engineering, he, so he and his team of uh, friends gathered together to come up with a company called Honeycomb, and he serves uh, served as a C chief technology officer of the company uh, and continues to do so. Uh, he has other ideas and ventures ongoing as well, which he's very excited to share. Uh, maybe during the program, I really leave it to him and Will uh, to talk about the, the startup as an engineer idea and everything else. So next, I pass it on to Ashay, please. Thank you so much, Vikram. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. Glad to have everybody on and super excited today to talk to Will. And as everybody knows, the theme for today is startup as an engineer. And this is something uh, close to my heart because I also uh, founded a startup as an engineer. The um, beauty of an engineer, I think, and the reason that engineers make good startup founders is that they're able to see uh, changes and systems and optimizations and systems at a visceral level that someone uh, without technical knowledge might not be able to. And this allows for the proliferation of products, um, technologies, inventions, system optimizations uh, that might not be visible to those uh, not um, in the startup space. And I think to talk a lot more about that, super excited to talk to Will, who I've known uh, from before. He's a super talented entrepreneur um, and he's a founder of uh, Leafy Home, also known as Oven, um, uh, Oven Labs. And William is originally um, an electrical engineer by trade, uh, where he focused on semiconductor design and uh, did a, a couple of career pivots, which I actually I want to ask him about too, uh, until now he's finally an entrepreneur with a vast array of experience in the electrical engineering field. Um, so Will, thank you so much for uh, coming on. Thank you, thank you. Can can you guys hear me okay? Thumb up? Yep, I can I can hear you good. Oh, yeah. Thank you everyone for spending time this evening or morning or afternoon, wherever you are. Uh, yeah, really, it's a big pleasure to be invited to be on the show and uh, have this chat with Dasha. And uh, yeah, like I said, I've known him before in the start, startup community here in Vancouver. Uh, it's an honor to be on here and share my personal personal perspective on and hear from everybody else. Yeah. Awesome. So, Will, um, what is a technology startup in in your view? Oh man. 
So, uh, yeah, I'll break this into two parts. Uh, so what is a startup? Let's first maybe talk about that. Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. This is actually when, when I hire uh, new, um, when I hire new employees, I actually go through this with them. Because I think like I, just, I, I saw this quote from uh, Steve Blank. Uh, if you guys know him, he's from Silicon Valley. He wrote a book um, uh, like uh, I can remember all the lean startup stuff came from him. So his definition of startup is a temporary organization uh, trying to find a scalable, repeatable, and profitable business model. And that, when I, when I read it, I, I keep reminding myself like what the startup is, because uh, I think a lot of times as engineers, we just want to build cool products and we forget that we're, what we're really doing is trying to find that business model uh, through a product. Maybe it's a techno, maybe it's a hardware, maybe it's a software. Uh, and then, so another key thing about startup is uh, it's, a, it's a temporary organization. Uh, nothing is guaranteed. Um, and it's not even a company yet. Uh, you're just a team trying to figure out, is there a business model uh, that can be repeated? Uh, can we scale up and then can be eventually be profitable? Uh, so I think that's, that's, uh, that's, and then once you find that business model, then you can start building a company. Um, so that, that's how I see what a startup is. And then definitely when it comes to a technology step, a startup, uh, some sort of technology needs to be there to be built to enable this business model. Um, yeah, so I think that that's pretty much how I understand technology startup. Yeah, and I think technology can be very broad. Right? I think you, you touched it. It can be, you know, whether that's a new product, something novel, or even just maybe a new way of doing something. Um, like the example might be like a Uber, which is actually just a new way of doing car sharing, uh, but not necessarily like a new, completely new technology itself. Yeah, awesome. yeah. Awesome. So, um, what inspires an engineer to create a technology uh, startup? When I hear this question, you know, I really want to ask this question to uh, Elon Musk. <laughs> I want to hear <laughs> yeah. his answer. Uh, I mean, like, I, I think for for myself, um, I, I was just just thinking how I got onto this journey because I've always been very entrepreneurial. Uh, I think I'm being very entrepreneurial always wanted to start something, build something that people can actually use. Uh, I've been reading a lot of like startup related books, like how other companies, successful companies in the early days, what did they do to figure out their product market fit? Um, but it took me a long time to actually quit my full time job and then jump into this. Um, and so I think the um, maybe like a growth mindset is what I was thinking about. But you always believe that you can do something bigger and then uh, bringing benefit to like bigger uh, customers. I think that's that's what I've always been thinking. And as an engineer, we always think that we can be solving problems. We're so good at it. Uh, so for me, I just wanted to solve a problem for millions of people. That's 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 how I got started on this. Awesome. Yeah, that's inspiring. Uh, you touched on something there. I wanted to ask you. Um, to you and for people who may not know, uh, how would you define product market fit um, for for the masses? Oh yeah, that's um, that's something I I think one definition uh, that I've heard before. I can't remember which podcast it is, but I think it was pretty good. It's uh, basically looking at your net promoter scores. Uh, if your users are promoting your product, recommending it uh, to others, like if your score is. Uh, for those of us who doesn't who's not familiar with that, it's basically a, you ask your ask your early users um, a question from the scale from zero to ten. How likely are you going to recommend this product or solution uh, to your friend, to to someone you know, basically? Um, and if you have like a high net promoter score, then that's a likely chance that you actually have a product market fit. Um, and then, because sometimes like you're not actually charging money right away, right? Um, and it's done sometime later than when you start charging money. That's that's another validation of product market fit. Uh, I'm not sure. What what do you think? Uh, sorry, help help yourself. Yeah, I mean, so your... I think that's a great definition. I think people say when uh, it's hard to get your product out of your hands uh, because there's so many people that want it. It's hard for you to really fulfill the the demand, and that's kind of something that they say in the valley. Um, a more broader definition could be maybe um, when. Uh, you have uh, a repeatable model for uh, 
your market where customers repeatedly want your product and across a varying across varying niches and not just one niche, maybe something like that. But yeah, yeah that's a great question. Yeah. So how do you think going back now, well, and maybe you can tell a little bit about kind of your, your history, but how did engineering and specifically your engineering education help you uh, to make your startup? My, okay. It's very related. <laughs> so, because uh, I, I went through school as an electrical engineer, um, and I was very into uh, hardware and software at the same time. Like so, so I naturally got into embedded software uh, and then semiconductor design. So, and uh, so, and I always believed that to build a great product, uh, you cannot just build hardware. You cannot just build software. Hardware is like the muscle, and then the software is the, the intelligence. So you have to have both to actually have something that works well. I think I'm almost describing a robot. <laughs> anyway, <laughs> you need, what's the firmware then? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know. Yeah, so, so uh, in my school, I actually had a lot of training on that end. And then uh, that really helped when, because I'm building, a, my, my company right now is a, a IoT company. So there's a lot of hardware, uh, a lot of software, uh, like uh, the front end, back end, like a full stack. So uh, a lot of those engineering knowledge come into play to help to build the product itself. Uh, but in terms of like actually building the company, I think um, nothing much actually came out from the school to actually help me to build a company. Yeah, now I'm thinking about it. Uh, I think, okay. yeah, it just helped me to build MVP faster. Yeah, that was the big thing. Yeah. And yeah, just uh, for those of you wondering, so MVP is minimal viable product, just uh, the minimum version of your product that you can have somebody use and test out. Um, and Will, so another thing, that's a really interesting point you brought up there that, you know, it kind of helped you with the thought process, but not directly building. Uh, building. And can you expand on that? Maybe like what in your day-to-day -day entrepreneurial journey that you, maybe your thought process, maybe uh, the way you look at your designs uh, is helped by your engineering education? Um, cause, uh, my role at Leafy, even though my title is CEO, but I also do a lot of like the CTO kind of stuff. Um, and I also interface okay. with customers. So I'm the product market fit guy, but I also oversees how we build the product. So I think what really helped is, um, being the, cause, uh, in a bigger organization, you really have a product manager and then you have uh, a technical lead. And then those two needs to talk to each other and negotiate back and forth what to build and what's the timeline, uh, what's the roadmap to shift things. So I think that's like, as an engineer, I have that all, all in my head. So sometimes it helps to uh, make decision faster, uh, better decision, or because uh, I have a, basically the feedback loop is inside my head. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so I, think, I think that really helps. Like for example, when I, uh, when I go out and visit uh, our better customers, like in their homes, right? And I will be interviewing them, but at the same time, I'll be thinking, oh, uh, is this feasible? How, how am I gonna build the technology for this as I'm going through those interviews? So I, I think that part really helps instead of having to come back to the office and talk to another person and then go back to the customer again to validate, is that what they want? So you can do all that like in almost real time. Yeah, no, that's great. Um. And I think, I, so now we've kind of touched on some of the positives, but what do you think are maybe some of the, the things that engineers, you know, need to work on uh, or things that um, they don't necessarily have the best skill set for uh, in entrepreneurship? So kind of the negatives. Mm, wow, man. I, I can throw a really long list for that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think um, teaching, presentation. That's one thing that was uh, it was pretty challenging for myself, um, okay. and um, also uh, I guess on the business side, like the financials and numbers, like you have to understand a little bit of that. How do how do you forecast something? Because I think the the real I guess the real challenge is like as engineers, you design things with rules, whether it's physics or um, software, it's almost like you're holding a crystal ball and be doing the design, but you know, with those rules, you know what the future design the outcome will be, right? Because it's, it's kind of predictable, but those business stuff, it's not as predictable. <laughs> there are no rules for yeah, a lot of things. Exactly. Yeah. 
don't know, okay, I do this, and then what's the outcome going to be? And it's going to take maybe three months, four months, uh, a year to actually see what the outcome is. So I think that that's that's very challenging. And as an engineer, I think we, we have to I have to learn how to adapt to that. And so what are some of the ways that you personally learned? I know you, you, you're you really good on self-learning. You watch a lot of podcasts, you read a lot of books. But what other advice do you have for uh, maybe more technically minded? Uh, I know we have some technical people here in the um, in the audience too that might be looking to do uh, an engine, uh, a startup, a technology startup. Right. Um, I think this is, I, I'm just going to throw a few things that's probably very um uh, personal to like to me, but I'm not sure if it applies to everyone. Um, so I mentioned about like teaching and presentation. Um, I think another thing is uh, uh, tends to overthink a little bit too much. Um, mm -hmm. I'm not sure if everybody have heard about uh, the the saying about one way door versus two way door. Like when you make decisions, like one way door is like, hey, I, I make this decision, there's no way back. Like quitting a job right. or uh, or marry someone almost, right? <laughs> and, <laughs> but two-way doors, you can you can easily make a change and then come back. So, but I think as engineers, I tend to make a lot of a lot. I tend to make treat a lot of like two-way door situation as a one-way door situation. Um, just being a little bit too cautious about things. Yeah, yeah, that's that's another thing uh, from my past experience. Yeah. Awesome, and. Uh, so one thing, and uh, I do see some uh, questions in the chat, but I think I'll um, kind of address them, some of them towards the end. Some of them I'll let you guys ask yourselves if you'd like to later on um, as I get through kind of the, some of the questions we have for Will. Um, but Will, so one thing is, why do you think that um, it is that we see a lot of technology entrepreneurs, uh, like if you look at the S&P 500, if you look at some of the top, you know, uh, companies with the highest market cap, they do have engineering background uh, people or technical people as uh, their leads or as CEOs. Mm. I think I've read an article about this before. Um, oh, nice. Yeah, and uh, if I could remember, my main takeaway is that uh, people with a technical background um, tend to have a little bit more grit, if that's the right word for it. Because when you went through school, like you, you go through, uh, figure out all those technical challenges and problems, it's 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 a it's it's tough. Like it takes a lot of mental uh, power and then patience to actually sit down and then like over and over again try something until you get it right. So and then uh, I'm not saying business people don't have that, but a lot of technical people just because the education, like the the experience, you have kind of have that that built into you already. And, and then maybe that's that great. What I've heard that is the number one thing that you need to be successful, uh, especially in the business world. So I think that that probably has some play in there. Yeah, no, that, that makes sense. Um, and I think one of the other things too that uh, we want to you know ask you for it in terms of um, advice is uh, work life balance because obviously uh, running a startup, a technology startup, is uh, very time consuming and. I can imagine, you know, I know you have a family. So how do you kind of balance uh, work-life balance? Or do you have any at all? If you have any at all. Short answer is there's no balance. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, no, I have a four-year-old son. And when I started Leafy, he was one year old. Yeah, that was about three years ago when I started. Yeah, so, uh, I mean, that was that was the first couple of years. Was, uh, the first year was really tough because he was two years old. I wasn't able to sleep well. Um, and during the day, there's a lot of things to think about uh, when you run yeah. your own, own startup, right? Technology, marketing, investors, uh, legal stuff, and then uh, market research and things like that. Um, and I, I think I, we, we used a lot of uh, uh, our moms as babysitters. Uh, so yeah. in the yeah, like in the evenings, you know, like uh, if I have nine to five jobs, and then we work until like uh, eight, eight o'clock eight o'clock, nine o'clock until the time to put him to bed. Uh, and we read the stories. Uh, that's something I think I'm very proud of. I always read stories for him um, in the that's last awesome. few years. That's awesome. Yeah. And then once it's asleep, okay, then come back to work again until like midnight. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a lot of time management and trying to be able to like balance both sides. But I think the, the, the trade-off here is uh, uh, much, much less, uh, I guess, uh, social activities with friends. 
and your own hobbies. That's that's the trade off. You want to have twenty four hours. Got it. Yeah. Um, no, I think and I commend you on that. Uh, I yeah I don't have a ch child, so uh, I don't have uh, as much time commitment as you. So I can only imagine uh, all the stuff you have to do on top of your uh, entrepreneurship uh, stuff. There is so there is one question that's kind of related uh, to what we talked to that I saw in the chat. Um, is what qualifies an engineer to be CEO rather than CTO? Um, and I think mm -hmm. that's a, it's a pretty interesting question. And when uh, what when in which cases might someone be a better CEO than a CTO? Oh, that's a really good question. Um, yeah, because I, I, I start because uh, to me, like CEO should be the person should be the uh, external facing person, right? Like CEO is the one who talks to customers to understand what needs to be built, uh, and then CTO should be the one that has the technology vision to deliver like the okay, what kind of technology do we need to build in order to um, uh, to satisfy the, the, the market, uh, to solve the problem or the customer's problem. So see, I, I guess like if we use the framework of problem solutions, so the CTO should be the one uh, building the solution, but the CEO should be the one directing, uh, trying identify the right problem to solve. Like a real identify, so identify the real problem and identify what problem to solve. I think that's CEO's job and then help that. Um, yeah, what do you think, Asha? I'm also curious. Yeah, I think uh, there, I think there are nuances to uh, a CEO. If you think about a CEO, a CEO's goal is actually a salesperson. Uh, so, it's, and two fronts, a CEO has two jobs. Number one is to sell the stock of the company uh, to investors and make sure that the value of the company increases over time. And uh, so, and the second goal is to de-risk operations in the company so that the company can operationally run as successfully as possible. And within that sphere, especially in a technology company, I think you have both the technical aspects that the CEO needs to handle a little bit. Um, and also being able to, when I spoke to the former, so being able to fundraise, um, really promote yourself to the investors. And a lot of times a CEO is often the first VP of sales of a company. Uh, so it the CEO is. does need to be, and I know you're, uh, you're definitely uh, one of the people that goes off and uh, sells uh, uh, pre-orders of your product. So uh, I know that CEO does need to be very adept at those skills. So I think those are skills that they need to do for an engineer. I think they're usually pretty good operationally. Um, I think they can put things and silo them into boxes and figure it out. But uh, sometimes uh, the sales skill is stuff that they need to work on. Yeah, I yeah, see a, a great totally related agree. question. Yeah, for sure. I see a great related question, which is, um, do you always need a co-founder or can you become a successful um, venture without one? And I'll rephrase it to you with, uh, kind of secondly, actually, because uh, do you have a co-founder, Will, in your company? Uh, yes, yes, I have a co-founder. Yeah. And yeah. are the, uh, how is, what is their background and how is it kind of complementary to yours? Um, <laughs> it's funny. So my co-founder is also my wife. <laughs> oh, awesome. And, awesome. Yeah. So, uh, and then she's not technical. She's a business person. Uh, oh, awesome. and, then, and then for, for her, she's, uh, she's taking a part-time role in Leafy because in the, she has a daytime job. Obviously we still have to make money and then pay all the bills and all that. Right. Um, and then uh, at the very beginning, I had a friend who was helping me with a lot of things. Um, and then I think I technically should be a co-founder as well, but later on, he just decided that he, he he's more he wants more of a work life balance, uh, like right. nine to five kind of job. So um, so yeah, I, I think coming back to that question, I think it's uh, I I feel the the challenge of just by yourself. So I have a lot of respect to the solo founders. Uh, doesn't matter what they do, you need a really strong heart and motivation to keep going in the dark times. Uh, but I think having the co-founder, one of the biggest things is uh, you can keep each other accountable. Uh, like even with my wife, like we have weekly meetings on Sundays, uh, like talking about nice. the leafy stuff, like business stuff, like what's the update? And then she will challenge my thoughts. I will challenge her thoughts um, and then things like that. And then uh, also when you're going through the dark times, uh, you need someone to kind of bounce off ideas with. Uh, I know some solo funders, uh, they find really good advisors who kind of like acting as that kind of sounding board, uh, which is great. 
um, it doesn't matter what you do. I think uh, when you are on this journey as entrepreneurs, there are so many ups and downs, and you have to find out like a way to uh, a person that you can help you to get through those tough times. Yeah. Yeah, that's great. And yeah, that's an awesome story that you have that uh, you guys are doing that together. That's amazing. Thank you. Thank you. So uh, with with that being said, so in similar to co-founders, um, so uh, when we're talking about uh, the theme, which is uh, technology founder, um, would you say that you would advise uh, an engineer who is looking to do a technology startup to find a more business oriented uh, partner or what skills would you uh, recommend that they look for in a co-founder if they're, if they're the engineering mm. person, you know? I think business, like, like if you are, if you're, if you have a technical background and uh, you, you, you are willing to talk to strangers, uh, meaning customers, right? I think that's good enough to get started because you can, you can build a, a MVP, like minimum valuable product and start showing to people, get their feedback. I think uh, like coming back to my point, I do think um, somebody with a technical background, but also customer facing like the product market fit guy is a really good combination because you can literally do that feedback in your own head and then go back to customer with something new and build something better. I think that that really buys a lot of time initially in the, uh, when your companies are early. And then like once you have a better idea about like what the uh, problem solution is, then, uh, then at that point you can you can go find a co-founder who's more business oriented, who's more like familiar with that space, who has interest on the problem that you're solving. So I don't think you have to bring in a business person at the very beginning if you don't already have one. Yeah. Yeah. Oh no, that's great. Uh, yeah, because you see a lot of times sometimes someone with a um, who has you know an idea will try and find a technical co-founder. Uh, so I think that on the if you look at it on the other side, uh, if you're right. not technical, then I do recommend you getting a technical co-founder in order to do that fill that role because there's a lot of gaps in knowledge that um, they'd be able to address. Um, I That's think true. this way around, the other way around, I think you mentioned it perfectly. I don't think you need to look right away and maybe maybe later. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Let's see. So. Do you have any other good questions? Okay, well, let's hop into this one. So what do you think makes a successful venture, in your opinion? Hmm, venture, right? So that's, that's very hard to define. I, I think you, you can you can say you want a like, billion dollar exit, that would be a successful one. Um, I think for, for, for me, um, my definition for Leafy is, um, we want to be in millions of homes. Uh, like our, our product is like, I'm not trying to provide uh, promoting Leafy here, but uh, because our, our product is a B2C, a direct to consumer product, uh, smart home, right? So uh, I think that's coming back to like, uh, why am I doing this? I, I want the product to be used by millions of people and helping them in their everyday life. Uh, and then that's kind of the, the the you know the, the the vision and then why I'm doing this. So um, I think if I get there, like uh, let's say uh, three million users, everybody's using my product every single day. I think that will be a definition for success for me. Yeah, awesome. And I think uh, don't worry about kind of promotion. I think it adds a little bit of context to to everybody watching. Um, but what is Leafy's product? If you can maybe quickly describe it so that everybody can get um some yeah, yeah, idea no about problem. it. Yeah, so so we um, we're basically uh, uh, creating a very innovative device that can be added onto uh, any any window blinds and turn them into a smart one. Uh, essentially, we're trying to build a system to control uh, sunlight. Yeah, with sensors and then um, software algorithm, basically. Yeah, and then and then sunlight really affects every everyone's like day to day life, but also uh, affects the building energy consumption. So uh, by controlling that in a scientific way then we can achieve both. Awesome. Yeah, no, that's great. And I I know because it's so expensive to get the, the full blind, smart blinds. But yeah, you're a retrofit one. Uh, I'll definitely, uh, when when it's in the market, I'll definitely be grabbing uh, some for myself. Sure. I'll let you know, of course. Yeah. <laughs> um, so there's a couple of questions on uh, that we've got on funding. Um, and kind of, so first, I guess, kind of a good segue is, uh, 
are what is your funding status? Like, are you bootstrapped? Have you raised some capital? Uh, what is kind of your personal situation? And then maybe we can elaborate on the different stages of funding, which uh, was asked. Right, right. Um, maybe I can step back a little bit just to um, give everybody a, net, a general idea about the different stage of funding. I think that's a good point. Like, um, I think with a lot of people, you you start with with yourself. You're bootstrapping. You put some money into the company. Uh, trying to get things going, or maybe you're just like not taking steps, just like living on your own expenses for a while. Uh, and then uh, I think friends and family uh, typically is the next run for a lot of people. Uh, so you, you're trying to talk to your friends, that's like low hanging fruit basically. Um, and then the next round I think um, would be uh, like getting non diluted funding. Uh, I'm pretty sure like. Uh, in Canada, in US, and in other parts of the world, the government has been putting money into the startup ecosystem uh, for innovation, right? Essentially, they want to drive the economy. So those things you should really uh, tap into if you can. Uh, and then, but in the same time, when you're trying to get those ones, that's where uh, you're probably getting to like angel investor. Um, and then once the angel investor, you're going out of angel investor, and it's like the micro VCs and get into bigger VCs. Uh, and then eventually, uh, if you get to the stage of talking to PE firms, uh, that's private right. equity firms, then you're really talking to big uh, institutional investors because um, PE usually gets invested like um, pre-IPO or post-IPO kind of deals. Yeah, so, this, so in my mind, I think that's the kind of groups of investors that you kind of talk to along the way. Um, and, and and for 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 DeFi, I we. Because uh, I've been, I, I had some savings before I started the company. Nice. I've been working for nice. more than 10 years. Uh, so I've been living on my own. We bootstrapped in the first year. Uh, and then starting the second year, we start talking to our friends and families um, and then just telling them about Because a lot of that, that's pretty easy cause, because uh, a lot of them, they know us already. Because in the very early stage, people invest in you, in yeah. not really yeah, so exactly. much about the product, right? It's more about you. So um, and then we, uh, we, we've been like talking to investors and we're raising an external uh, run right now. Yeah, that's where we are. Hoping to launch the product next year. Summertime. Nice. Yeah. yeah. All the best. I, I, think, I think it'll go well. Um, Thank you. So Thank another you. thing is what was asked is when venture funding might be required. I think you kind of touched on it, but I think basically if you don't need to raise outside capital, don't, right? Because why are you going to yeah. dilute yourself? And the second thing is, and if you're at a stage where you're growing so fast, people will, will give you money and it'll be a lot easier to raise. So it'll right. be um, a better po point for you to raise at that time. So yeah. you mentioned kind of some of the government uh, funding things that are available that are non-dilutive. Um, because we have kind of a local BC um, audience here, uh, can you talk a bit about you know BC's tech uh, scene and what kind of grants or fundings are available immediately for entrepreneurs here? Oh, good, yeah. I mean, that, that's one thing I think it took me a long time to figure it out. Like when I first started, there's so many programs and everything's kind of scattered around. There's no good website. Um, but I think recently UBC actually has another startup. It's called Pocketed. So they have a platform where you can help you to search like different grants and fundings like that. Like if you are in Canada, I, I strongly encourage you to take a look at that website. It's called Pocketed. Um, and so, but in general, like, I think there are, um, I would say it's probably like a two, no, three types of uh, fundings in that, in that area. So, so number one is for students, uh, somebody who's still in school, you can get some subsidies for their salary. Number two is for youth. So somebody's out of school, but they're under 30 years old. And then there's uh, different programs uh, targeting that range. Um, and then again, it's a salary subsidy. Um, but remember, like all those programs, you actually have to pay them uh, 100% to actually pay them. And then you claim it back later uh, from the government. So you still need that money. But I think I, I talked to somebody who thought they are going to get the money up front and <laughs> totally kind of no, like no. messed up their hiring stuff. Yeah. And then uh, I think the last one uh, is more of a formal projects you can define with uh, with different organizations because uh, um, that's that's where either you have a partnership with like the, the UBC or you have an industry partner uh, to do like a pilot uh, program 
yeah, so that there's a lot of funding for for that kind of project based stuff as well. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, and uh, just two quick ones that IRAP and Shred are really big ones. Oh yeah, uh, right. For in Canada, right. so that you can do. Um, awesome. So, well, another thing that um, I want to ask you about actually is uh, when you came up with the idea, right, for your startup, and then kind of uh, if you can walk us through kind of a, a bit of anecdotally what it was like from idea to MVP, like that kind of stage and what kind of things and resources you need, because a lot of people, they might have an idea, but they don't know where to get started or they don't know how to get to an MVP. So maybe you can speak to that. Sure. Sure. Yeah, that was a fun journey to be honest. <laughs> so um, maybe, maybe uh, uh, talk a little bit about like how, how did I get started on this? Um, Cause uh, that was when my son was born. Uh, and we, we had a lot of like smartphone products, like uh, Wi-Fi plugs, light bulbs, and vacuum robots, thermostat, a lot of those. Uh, and my wife had to open and close window blinds um, like right. six, seven, eight times a day because the baby needs to go through a day nap. Uh, and then they need to learn when it's uh, sleeping and wake up schedule like that. So that was the, that was that, that's what really like triggered everything. And I was like, oh, there must be a better way to do this. Um, and then we just moved into a townhouse. There's so many windows, right? Um, so I started to search online and I find, like you said, I find all oh, those replacing the whole thing. That's just astronomical. The price is crazy. Um, and then there are some like 3D printed solutions on YouTube I could find, but none of nice. those are going to be like a long-term thing. Um, and so it's like, okay, there's uh, maybe I can think about something because I always want something that uh, looks better. Uh, that actually works for like uh, a lot of people, like in, store, in terms of the installation wise, it's simple to install. So I try to prototype some ideas with even just like cutting the foam boxes and then just uh, tape it together <laughs> and then kind of start showing to, uh, started showing showing my wife first and showing my friends, okay. And, and then what kind of like shape and size make more sense if I give them something that can do the job. Um, and then, so, so that's that's like one of the first uh, I guess like a user interview, and it doesn't cost you any money. You can still be at work and just do it on the site. Um, and then uh, you can always do a lot of user interviews. Um, you can say, uh, so one of one of the questions I ask them is like, hey, basically, well, would you pay uh, if I if I just stand next to your window blinds and I just open and close to you? Would you would you be interested for that kind of service? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's kind of lame to ask that, but. Uh, basically, a lot of uh, Q and A's with people around me, and then later on, yeah. I started to. I, I was like, okay, I need to show people how this actually works. So that's when I st have to uh, sit down and start to learn a lot of things outside of my own technology background. Like for example, mechanical. So I borrowed the book yeah. from one of my mechanical friends, their textbook. Uh, and then uh, on the software side, I'm not so much of a cloud technology guy. But I had to uh, right. learn the AWS, and then my 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 friend at the time, co-founder at the time, and he was helping us with the mobile app site. So we still have to build something for people to try and experience it. Um, and then that all of that doesn't take a lot of money; it just takes a lot of uh, your own time and passion to to get through. Yeah, in order to build something, I'm sure you can echo a lot of that too as a CTO. That's no, I think that's a, a great response. It kind of very thorough and covered kind of the entire cycle. Uh, there's a couple of questions here that I, and I, I did really want to ask you about that in that same sphere is regarding um, HR, because hiring is obviously a very important part of your job as a CEO. And for any technology company, the team is uh, essential, not just to building the product, but also in order to raise capital to build a better product. Um, so first question kind of is, um, how did you go about building kind of your first team? You kind of hinted it there with uh, someone who helped you with the app, someone who helped you kind of with backend. But uh, how did you see kind of the gaps you needed to fill and how did you go about uh, hiring for those roles? Because it is very challenging to hire. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Um, let's say look into your, uh, uh, look in your team for the skill gaps, right? Uh, I think like what, what you need, like for me at the time, um, I, I wanted to some mechanical engineering help, software help. So, I, and I had a software co-founder, so that's good. But mechanical wise, like I have to step up and then try to uh, figure out myself because I couldn't find any mechanical engineers. Um, and, but like, I think building a team wise, I, 
I would really uh, encourage everyone when you, if you're going through like an interview process, look for people uh, hire hire for motivation. Uh, their passion and motivation. I think that's that's more important than uh, like uh, their past experience or their existing. Uh, what do they know? It's more about why do they do it. I think that that's that's more important. Yeah, no, that's that's yeah. great. Um, and I think someone asked about um, kind of churn. Like, how do you? Is there a magic wand uh, to deal with churn? Uh, there isn't. A magic wand is called magic wand for a reason. You're it's going to churn and. Uh, what you have to do is embrace that there might be churn and try and de-risk it as much as possible. So with that being said, what are ways, Will, that you have kind of implemented in your companies to try and you know keep people around or keep them motivated to stay rather than to join uh, the many other technology companies that they might have access to joining? Hmm. Um, very good question. Um, so in my company, Actually, that hasn't happened so far. <laughs> oh, nice. So, nice. Yeah, yeah. So you I, have except, the magic wand, maybe. Well, well except <laughs> that, like that, my first co-founder, like I mentioned, because they realized that's not something for him, and he still want to go back to like nine to five job for the work-life balance. Um, but the other ones that I have hired so far, like employees, we have about five and five engineers right now. Like, um, I think, I think probably. So no, number one is when you're hiring, you you find the people who can. Um, go through like a who has that kind of grit who who who's passionate who's motivated uh and then once they're on the team then you need to keep them motivated keep them challenged and transparency i think is what i've heard from my team uh, and one thing about transparency that i'm quoting from somebody else is it's not about telling them every single thing that you did every single day that's not transparency it's about uh, when you're making a decision uh, you provide clarity on why you make that decision. You spend the time to help them to understand, even if it's something that's not related to exactly their job, but they want to hear why do you make that decision. I think that that helps. Nice, yeah. Uh, another one. So contract. Uh, so have you hired contractors uh, mostly, or have you had kind of more long-term employees? So I'll kind of start with that, and then I'll ask a, a segue. Sure, sure. Yeah, contractors. Yes. I've hired contractors, contractors outside Canada, uh, contractors in Canada. Um, and um, I guess like maybe the question is about like how, my, what's my experience with contractors? Would that, would that be accurate? My understanding um, of the question? Yeah, so uh, if you, yeah, that would be a great thing for you to answer first and then I'll ask you a response. Yeah. Sure, yeah. Um, managing the contractors is the uh, art. <laughs> like, it's... Uh, yeah, we, we've had some like good, good, good projects with contractors, and we have some um, not so good ones. Uh, and I, like for me, like because I was an engineer and I've never managed con external contractors before. Sorry, the light just went off. Hold on, let me just turn it off. No worries. Yeah. Um, I guess so. Should we uh, contractors versus long term um, commitments? contractors are like mercenaries and long-term employees are like missionaries. And when you're building a company, you want more missionaries and people who are there for your cause rather than there for potentially a paycheck or money. I understand that it might help out with your short-term runway and help your uh, dedicate your finances more, but you do want to find people who are passionate about your business because if they're not there, being able to be there with you 2 a.m. in the morning when you're working on something, then uh, you're not going to be have a chance to survive. So yeah, that was just my two cents. Mm -hmm. Will, are you back? Yes, yes, I'm back. Yeah. Uh, just give me one second. I need to turn off the Google Google speaker. No worries, no worries. So this is this is my clock uh, when I need to get off work and put my son to bed. But today no I'm fine. My wife's got it. Hey, Google, stop. Yeah, so let's have a look at some of the questions. Sorry about that. Yeah, it's one of the things that I implemented in house with smart homes so that uh, when the time is up, turn off the lights, turn on the music. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so so th there are some great uh, audience questions uh, that, and I think uh, all of my questions, I think you kind of uh, answered. And I think a lot of the audience ones are similar. If there are any people in the audience that would like to um, themselves ask the questions rather than me reading them out, uh, feel free. I know. Uh, uh, I know there's a couple here uh, from similar people. So if you'd like to, uh, uh, maybe Bikram, you can kind of spotlight them or uh, be able to bring them on. I don't know what the situation is with uh, audio. Uh, 
I know Mr. Uh, Pramod Chatterjee had uh, a few very good uh, questions. Um, if you'd like to ask, okay, yeah, uh, Bikram says, let's just continue with the uh, the chat questions. Um, okay. Okay. Yeah, we can see what Charles missed here. There are some uh, questions more about Leafy as well. Will some more people are interested? Uh, so feel free. So um, if you can go into it a little bit more, uh, and the question here is uh, about uh, there's a couple of questions about angel investing as well. Mm. So one question here is an interesting one. I'm actually I was actually curious about this as well. So do you mod do your monitor solar heat gain through your product, and how do you optimize the home for energy efficiency using shading? I think that's a great question. That yes, and we're we're working with um uh just, sorry my son just ran into the room. Okay, <laughs> no, okay. Doesn't it's just gonna bump this interview process. Um, yeah. So so in terms of that, uh, we we are working with uh, building energy um engineers. Uh, we have to go through simulations and um uh, and then you know basically track where the sun is and then um that's. That's something I'm not an expert on, and that's not something that we have fully started yet. Um, but yeah, definitely that's that's an area where we see there's a huge value in, uh, especially commercial like office buildings. Right. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. Yeah. Let's see some other questions from uh, the audience. Um, I'm gonna jump in here just to follow up with the question, but it's pretty loud where I am, so I'm just wondering, do you guys hear me well? Yeah, 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 very okay. good. I'm just at a coffee shop. Um, so yeah, like I, I'm interested. You said you're working with like energy advisors, um, and you're looking at like the energy modeling of a, of a home or a building and how you like um, optimize that solar heat gain and shadowing. Um, are you looking at like the sustainability aspect of your uh, startup and um, like, for example, the clean VC uh, um, and, you know, the, the, the strategy that's going in Canada to reach net zero and whatnot, is that something that you have in mind or it's more of a start on like a product innovation that came from mm -hmm. uh, I mean, that's um, the, the idea that you're describing, right? Uh, passive heating, passive cooling, um, and then modeling all that. It's, uh, it's not a new idea. Uh, I've read a lot of like academic research um, to show how actively managing the shading of the building actually helps with the energy saving. So that, that's been out there for like 10, 20 years already. Um, but I think recent years, it's the popular, it's the IoT technology that's really um, uh, changing that. And uh, yeah, sorry, just my, my sound is a little bit distracting in here. Um, <laughs> And what's his what's his name? Well, his name is Harvey. <laughs> nice. Yeah, yeah. Sorry about Welcome that. Welcome to the show, Harvey. Great to have you here. Thank you for joining us as well. <laughs> that was yeah, feel, yeah. Feel free to sit with Daddy and 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 join us in the chat. We love your smiles for sure. Yeah. yeah please yeah. go ahead. I will. <laughs> Everything's all right. It's a really uh really good wind down evening chat fireside chat, I guess. Uh, so yeah, yeah. No. Um. Sorry, I didn't get your name. Uh, where was asking that question. Um, but yeah, there is, um, if you're talking about the sustainability side, yes, of course there is, um, but it really depends on the beachhead market. Like if we're just starting out like where we are, it's more of a B2C. Um, for like residential homes, that may not matter very much. Like even if you look at like Google Nest or Echo Bee, they do promote uh, like saving energy, but for like small homes, it's not so much, right? It's really like when you're, when we're talking about commercial buildings, that will become like a big part in their uh, how they evaluate the the value proposition. So you're working right now with uh, like residential homes are your main customer. Yeah, yeah. Well, we're targeting residential homes first. Amazing. Yeah. And um, like just just I, I've been in this industry, so just curious, how do you target them from a B two B lens rather than a B two C lens that you have to reach out separately and do you know marketing and outreach for for homeowners individually? Yeah, um, I mean we 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 have some conversations with like office building operators um, to understand their pain points. Uh, why do they um, manage uh, window coverings, window shading um, uh, automatically? Because uh, uh, a lot of them, they already have like smart lighting, uh, smart HVAC systems. 
So this just adds another degree of how they can control um, like the, the heating or uh, the energy usage inside the building. Yeah, that is definitely the, like this, this kind of like uh, energy saving technology is also helping uh, when it comes to like government projects and getting some of the funding, I think. Yeah, we, we haven't got there yet, but I think it will help. That sounds amazing. So you, you deal with the contractors and the contractors uh, sell to the homeowners. So I'm guessing this is sort of a B2B2C model, right? Uh, potentially, yeah, yeah. But the, the way we design the product, it could be a direct to consumer as well. Yeah, but the contractors will definitely help to uh, open up like another channel to get to the end consumers. Sweet. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, I know Nora, she's also in the Vancouver um, startup scene, oh, very, yeah. very uh, knowledgeable about clean tech. So thank you, Nora. Oh, um, nice. Mr. Promo we'll Chatterjee, do you have? Would you like to ask? I know Mr. Pramod Chatter, you had a lot of really good questions. Uh, uh, if you would like to ask uh, yourself, feel free. Come on. Well, I have I have some uh, for you then as well. So, what roles? Um, I know I saw that you guys are posting a role for a uh, firmware uh, uh, a firmware uh, engineer. Is, and that's a really difficult role to hire. What are some other roles that are really difficult to hire personally for you that you find uh, very challenging in Vancouver? Mm. Things have changed in the last six months. Because <laughs> uh, six months ago, if I'm going out there hiring software, I think that's really, really hard. Uh, I mean, you're, you're, uh, you're a software guy, you know, like how, how, pe how, how people get paid, right? So for yeah. hard, uh, for startups to compete with Amazon and Microsoft, that's that's hard. But I think in the that's last hard, few yeah. months, it's a lot easier now uh, for software. Um, and then firmware wise, I think there are candidates, and I wouldn't say it's the hardest one to to hire, uh, but it's hard to find a good one. Um, um, that's that's how I feel about firmware. Um, I still don't have a good feel about marketing or business hire. Um, okay. Like I've used like interns before, but I, I still don't feel like I find the right um, skill or experience that I'm looking for. So that that's something like personally, I think at Leafy we're, we're still trying to figure out like on who's the right business person to be on the team. Yeah, and what kind of what kind of skills do we need? Awesome. Yeah, and yeah, so I think um, uh, I want to kind of circle back to you know our uh, the theme. So the theme of today's obviously was startup uh, uh, technology startup uh, as an engineer, and I think we touched on a lot of points there, and then some advice that uh, we could uh, give for uh, engineers and how you know will yourself made some um, uh, really good points about that. And I think for me, what kind of stood out for the theme is one is how much you've thought of everything end to end. So not just from, you know, an engineering standpoint, but you mentioned a lot of things about product market fit, about building an MVP, all of these, which are very uh, important, not just for an engineer, but for all startups. And I think engineers uh, have uh, the ability to kind of go really go on the product side, but also for your ability to think about that and reason at it from a more nuanced lens uh, is really something that stood out to me. Um, and as for advice, I think we kind of touched on uh, a couple of advices that we could give um, finding a potential co-founder uh, that has complementary skills to yours if um, you don't, uh, figure out a couple of different ways to hire. And uh, really, well, I think there is uh, some pretty interesting side discussions too about your experience and of Leafy. Um, so I think this is a thank you. pretty great talk. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. I, I hope and thank you so so I want to first, uh, before I send it back, I want to thank everybody who was here in the chat. Um, the very uh, lively chat too. Some very great questions that really made my job a lot easier. Uh, excellent uh, questions. Uh, shout out to uh, yeah, Mr. Pramod Jetterji, uh, Nora. Uh, great questions. Um, and yeah, without further ado, I'll throw it back uh, back to Bikram. Well, that was the Reading Reveler series for 
uh, talk with Will and Asha today. Uh, it was great to have you all. We are three minutes from the closing session. And uh, please expect this video to come online live. Uh, it's going live on YouTube already. Uh, we will have it uh, posted on uh, on YouTube again, the, the final version. And we'll also send out the notes from the this conversation. Very well thought through conversation. Uh, very, very thoughtful questions from the audience as well. A great participation. I really love uh, all of your attendance here today. Thank you so much for coming to the Reading Reveler series. Thanks to Will, thanks to Ashe, thanks to everyone.